Good morning, good morning, good morning. And welcome to New Covenant Fellowship Church. We are so happy to see each and every one of you this morning. Whew, all right. The sun may not be out outside, but the sun is in here. The sun is in you, the sun is in me. And we are here to let his glory rise in this place this morning. So if you feel like it, stand to your feet and worship along with us this morning. Let his glory rise.
future, above all our problems, he's above all.
I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name talking about God and as we get to know God this forgiveness and after we live life I guess I've been around for 66 years now so I've done enough things that I'm not proud of you know and I just I want to be clean and the reality is starting to sink in as an old man the reality is starting to sink in that I'm clean because of the cross. And I pray this morning, I pray that we realize that when we take communion, that God help me to sense the reality, to feel the sense of reality of what really happened at the cross, that I am clean because of you. And uh, I'm not going to preach. Anyway, so... Let's, let's go together this morning and prepare our hearts because God has something for you in the message today. And he also has a moment for us to take the time and thank him for what he has done. Okay, so let's go together this morning. Heavenly Father, wow, forgive us for taking lightly what was done at the cross. Forgive us for thinking of that as an abstract event. Yeah, it was true, but I, how does it affect me? And I'm just being honest, and that's the way I spent much of my young life. But thank you. Thank you that you're opening my eyes to see what that really, the meaning of what that is. And obviously, it was an infinite occasion, and I can't understand all of it until I get to heaven, but I am getting a better sense now. And I pray this morning that as we come together to celebrate what the cross, what Christ did at the cross, that you will give us that sense, all of us, give us that sense of the wonderful, incredible love that you would reach down to and die, send your son to die for your enemies. And not only did he die for his enemies or for your enemies, but after he died and paid the price, you brought us into your family. That's just amazing. You call us sons. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. I pray also this morning that you will prepare our hearts for what the pastor has for us. Because there is nothing greater, according to Paul, Philippians 3, there is nothing on this planet greater than knowing Christ, than knowing you. So I pray that you will help us to see you in a new way this morning after pastor's message. 
and that not only do we see you in a way, a newer way, but that it changes the way I live today and tomorrow and from now on. We thank you for what you're going to do. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, we're the Hayes and welcome to New Covenant Church Online. As we get started, let's get you connected. Click the link above and fill out the connection card or jump into the chat. 
We'd love to get to know you better. You can always join us in person every Sunday at 1030 on Northmore Road. Directions to our door can be found at ncf.church. Plan your visit now at ncf.church slash connect. Okay, the service is about to begin, so let's worship. We know Jesus as a promise keeper. I know I do. No matter what I've gone through or what I'm going to go through, he's always brought me through. I can call him in the morning or I can call him in the middle of the night. And when I call him, he'll make everything all right. Come on. Jesus is a promise keeper. Woo!
whenever there's a victory in the ministry where God has done something miraculous and uh, we had been waiting for him to show up and he does show up, I generally will lift up my hands, praising him for what he's done. Steph Curry, when he was uh, playing for the final game of the NBA uh, championship, uh, he hit a three-pointer and folks went crazy. And after he made that shot, he took his hands, his index fingers raised, and he pointed toward the God in heaven. And he gave him the credit for what he had done in his life. And one of his favorite verses is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's a wonderful verse to have. I don't know if you have that verse as one of your favorites, but it certainly is mine at times. Last week we saw Nebuchadnezzar look up toward heaven, his eyes looking into heaven at the Most High God. And Nebuchadnezzar, for those of you that hadn't studied that, uh, he was the king at that time, and uh, he asked for everybody to bow down and worship him and to dance to his music that they had come up with. And uh, he looked up toward heaven at the end of a, 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 a punishment, and he gave God the credit for what God had done and uh, what God had uh, done for him, and he made a public acknowledgement of who God was. Before that scene, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of a tree, a tree that was full of foliage and uh, fruit, and uh, everybody was coming to this tree uh, to get fruit, and everybody was feeding off of this tree, and he was just so amazed by all that. And then something scared him when the angelic host from heaven showed up and gave him another scene, told him that that tree was going to be chopped down to its stump, but a band would be put around it. All of the animals and all of the people that came to him for food, for fruit, and all that, they would desert him, and he would be living like a, a, a dehumanized and deranged human being for a period of time. And he didn't understand what it meant. So he asked for his soothsayers and his fortune tellers and his priests to come and uh, interpret the dream for him. But unfortunately, none of them could. But Daniel could. Daniel was uh, a person to whom God had given uh, certain kinds of abilities to be able to understand visions and also to, to understand dreams as well. And he told Nebuchadnezzar, he was the tree in his dream. But if he didn't repent of his sin, the sin of, doing, of not doing righteous acts, the sin of not showing mercy to the poor, if he didn't repent of that, then he would be just like that tree in his dream, chopped down with a stump, like a stump with a band wrapped around it, and he would be living like a beast. Well, Nebuchadnezzar did not heed Daniel's warning. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar just had a problem with pride. He had the pride of his palace. He had the pride <laughs> of his power and the pride of his perspective. And we saw that last week. Nebuchadnezzar had an ego addiction. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30, we'll just see that just to bring you up to speed on what's happening. It says, the king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal resident, my palace by my might, the might of my power for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared sovereignty has been removed from you. In other words, you're going to lose your power and your position because of what you just said. And you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you. That seven periods of time means seven years until you recognize that the Most High 
is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows on it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, kind of like uh, Cam Newton's hairstyle. Uh, and his, his nails like bird's claws. And uh, he had decided that he would not repent, and so he was struck with what's called lycanthropy. Lycanthropy is, uh, is the supernatural trans transformation of a person into the form of a beast. And uh, it affects not only their mentality, but it also affects their look and everything else because whatever, whatever their mind changes to, that's what they start to act like. Nebuchadnezzar's refusal to repent of his uh, pride is really a warning to us, I said last week. It's a warning to us who sometimes think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Sometimes we have the pride, uh, and, and pride in, in and of itself is not wrong, but it's when it's all about you that it becomes a problem. When, when you don't have pride in God, and you have pride in yourself instead, that's a problem. When you don't have, have pride in what God has done for your life, and in your life, and in the lives of other people, uh, then you have a problem. There's a saying, to the victor goes the spoil, meaning the person who succeeds beyond all others is entitled to the rewards associated, associated with that particular success. So the spoils can be either public acknowledgement of who God is, or it can be an offering given to God for what God has done. Well, Nebuchadnezzar did both in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34. It says, but at the end of that period of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me when, when he raised his eyes toward heaven. And then he said, and I blessed the most high, El Elyon, and promised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. There's no end to it. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he, God, the Most High, does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. God does whatever he wishes on earth, he does. That's why in the Lord's Prayer we pray, Thy will be done in heaven as it is in earth, on earth. So, 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 so what he's saying is, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done, God? Why did you do me like that? You can't ask God that question because he's in control and uh, you don't have the authority to question him. All that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out because they had deserted me. So I was established, reestablished. I was reestablished, and my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven. He's doing this publicly. He's praising God publicly, something that some folks who call themselves Christians don't even do. But he's doing it publicly. For all his works are true and his ways are just. That word just means righteous. And people talk about justice and all that. What, what they don't understand about that word is that there's only one person who's just and there's only one person who's righteous. And that's God. He's just and he's righteous. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Now, Last week, I left you with three points to ponder. I told you, don't take credit for what God has done. And I said, if you don't understand God's word, then ask God for help. And then I said, 
When God warns you, respond to him immediately. That was last week. This week in Genesis, we're going to see Abe's compassion for his nephew, Lot, who'd been taken captive because of his choices. And because of, Abraham, because of Abraham's victorious rescue, he has courage. He showed courage in the Most High God. He showed courage and compassion for his, his nephew Lot as well because Lot had fallen into hard times because he had been taken captive. And uh, God allowed Abraham to have enough courage to face these four kings that he was coming up against. And Abe's victorious rescue of, Abe's, uh, of his uh, nephew Lot and of the defeated kings Gave, they gave him the spoils as a result of his victory, but he gave victory to the Most High God. He gave him credit for all that he had done, El Eldion. Now, that's the name that designates God as the supreme ruler of all the universe. That means on earth, outer space, throughout the heavens, as far as you can go, He's in charge of it all. Whatever happens in the heavens, he determines that. Whatever comes down here on earth, he determines that. Whatever happens on earth, he permits it. Nothing happens without God's permission. You, you, you say, well, wait a minute. I voted, and I voted so and so and so and so in office. You voted, but God chose the person. So wait a minute, but they won by a landslide. God allowed it to happen. Whoa, wait a minute, why do I vote? You, that's your civic duty. But at the end of the day, nothing happens without God's permission. You say, well, why should I vote? Because that's your civic duty. But you can't get credit for it. You can't get credit for nobody being in office that you voted for. You can't take credit. You know who takes credit? God does. He says, I put kings in office. I put them in authority. You do your part, but then I have the final word. I'm thinking, what? Yeah. It, nothing happens when it is. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. Prove that to me. <laughs> I will. Remember Satan going to Job, those of you who know the story, he had to get permission from whom? He had to get permission from God to kill Job's children and, and, and destroy his, his cattle and his livestock and his servants. And then he went back and got permission to afflict Job with these boils and all that. But he could not touch Job because before that, without permission, because God had a hedge of protection around Job. And Satan knew that. In fact, that's what he went to, God, went, to, went to God and said, look, he said, I know you got a hedge of protection around him, but if you remove that hedge for a minute, uh, then I can touch him. And God said, you can't touch him, but this is what you can do. You can go this far, but no more. And remember what Jesus told, his, told uh, 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 Pilate. Jesus told Pilate in John chapter 19, he says, Pilate, you wouldn't have any power over me at all unless you had been given the authority from heaven. So even Pilate did not have authority over Christ. God gave Pilate authority over Christ, and God gives the enemy authority over our lives when God has to discipline us or when God wants us to learn a lesson by sending us through a trial. Now, all trials are painful, but they're all timed. God doesn't allow you to stay uh, in, in, in a trial all of your life. It, it's kind of like a barbed wire fence. There's some smooth points, and then there's some sticky points. That's kind of what the way life is, isn't it, sometimes? You're going through a smooth spot, and then what do you know? There's a pothole. <laughs> and then your whole life is out of alignment for that brief moment. And then you wonder, well, why in the world don't somebody fix that? Stop for a moment. Why did, you, why did you hit that pothole? Oh, God permitted it. Why did he permit it? I don't know. Well, uh, just pray. 
and ask God, God, show me why I did this or show me why this is happening to me. Why am I going through this trial? And he'll tell you like he told uh, First Peter. He said, um, this trial is to, is to test your faith, to prove to you that your faith is genuine. And a lot of times we have to go through things because we lose faith in God's ability and God has to allow some things to happen so that we will come back, give him the credit and not take the credit. So when God does that, when God does what? When God works all things together for our good, then that's when we should give the spoils for our victory to God because nothing just happens. Whatever happens, God allowed it to happen, and then we got to know that he's working it all together for our good. If you keep loving him, it's going to work out for your good. You may not understand it. You may not get an, a, a clear a message about why it happened, but understand that it's, not for, it, it, it's, it's happened for a reason, and God never does anything without a reason behind it. So when God does that, when he works all things together for our good, we give him the spoils of our victory. If it's a promotion, if it's a, 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 if it's a word of God that's come into your life and that just lit up your spirit, give him the credit for, for showing that and revealing that to you because he's a victor in all the things that happen in our life. Now, let me give you a little background before I get into Genesis because I'm going to be digging in some heavy stuff, not really heavy, but some thick weeds here, and I just want to kind of clear it out just a little bit so that you'll understand what's happening between Lot and Abraham. Lot and Abraham left a place called Haran. Before they reached Haran, Acts chapter 7 says that God spoke to uh, Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. I don't know what God said to Abraham at that time, but he told, he, he must have shown Abraham something because it says so in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2 that, uh, that he was going to, something was going to happen to him. And so when God speaks to him in chapter uh, 11, and then in, 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 rather in chapter 12, and it tells him to move from where he is, which is Haran, Abraham moves immediately. Why? Because if you go back to Acts chapter 7 and verse 2, it explains to you that God spoke to him before he reached Haran to, 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 to uh, make him aware of the fact that he was going to use him in, in some way or another. Now, when Abe got to the outskirts of Canaan, which is where he was going to go in chapter 11, Abraham, God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, he said, I'm going to give your descendants this land. And so Abraham looked across all of the terrain of, the, of, the Cain, of, Cain, uh, of Canaan, and uh, he said, wow. And so what he did was, in honor to God, he built an altar there to the Lord, and it's the first time anyone calls on the name of the Lord. So Abraham built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. Well, why? Because he was showing publicly that he believed in the God that spoke to him originally in Mesopotamia before he got to Haran, before his daddy died, and after his daddy died in chapter 12 when God told him to leave his country. So he built an altar there to publicly say, I believe in the God that called me out of Haran. And so Abraham built his altar and called on the name of the Lord. It was an open confession of faith in God. But a famine came where he was, and rather than trust God, he went down to Egypt where there was some food. But when he went down to Egypt, he, uh, he asked his wife to lie about her being his wife and said, say you're my sister. And it wasn't totally a lie because she was related to him in, in a way, but she was also his wife immediately. But Abraham was afraid that people would kill him and, 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 and take his wife anyway. So he was trying to save his skin. So he says, why don't you just say that you are uh, my sister? So Pharaoh sees her. She's a very beautiful woman. Pharaoh sees her, takes her into his palace. And when a, when a, when a king takes a woman into his pal palace, uh, it's going to be a part of his entourage, a part of his harem. And so what he's saying is, you're going to be a concubine, or if you're that beautiful, I will probably marry you. So she, she was chosen to maybe be Pharaoh's wife eventually. Well, God jumped into all that. Now, God allowed Abraham to go down there, but God didn't tell Abraham to lie. But God stepped in. That night, Pharaoh had a dream 
I mean, that night, Pharaoh's house was struck with some sort of disease, and God did that to get his attention. There was a plague throughout his whole palace and throughout the entire house. And so Pharaoh realized that, wait a minute, something is wrong, and he must have understood that Sarah was not supposed to be in his house. I don't know how he figured that out, but he figured it out. And so he called Abraham. He says, Abraham, why did you lie to me about her not being your wife? Why did you tell me she was your sister? He says, get out of here. So he said, now give Abraham anything he wants. Uh, in fact, just give him all this. Give, give him livestock. Give him whatever it is. Just get him out of here. So Pharaoh loaded him down with a whole bunch of stuff. So Abraham leaves. And as he's leaving, he's going back to the place where he built an altar. And so Abraham is there. But while he's there, his herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen get into an argument because the herds are so big and, 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 the, and their herdsmen are arguing because they're arguing about who's going to eat the grass. They're arguing about this little thing. And so uh, Lot went to Abraham and says, uh, Abraham, he says, look, our herdsmen are arguing with one another. There's strife between them. And so Abraham said, look, I've got, God promised my descendants all this land, so I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick out what part of all this land you want to go and, and, and live in, and then whatever you don't choose, then I'll choose what's left. So Lot chose Sodom. And when he left, the Bible says he went as far as Sodom. He didn't go all the way into Sodom. He went as far as Sodom to the outskirts, but he didn't go all the way. And so when um, Abraham looked around, his, 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 uh, his, his nephew was gone, and Abraham took the other part of the land, and that land was promised to Abraham and, uh, and his descendants. And so God allowed Abraham to have what he wanted and a lot to have what he wanted. Now, Lot, because of his choice, he's going to suffer because of his choice. It has been said, if you lie down with dogs, you come up with fleas. Proverbs says it even better. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but if you keep company with fools, you will suffer harm. So Lot decided to have company with some fools in Sodom. And he's going to suffer for his choice. Now, there are three firsts in Genesis chapter 14. The first time God Most High is mentioned, the first time there is a war, and the first time a tithe is given. I know immediately some of you say, oh, he's going to be preaching about tithing. I'm not. Look, just relax. Whatever you give to God is up to you. Okay, it's not a, 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 you know, a backhanded message about tithing. And if you're getting uh, convicted, maybe God's talking to you about it. And so if you, if, you, if you got all tight, then God is saying you're not living right. So give me what's mine, and, uh, and, and, and you won't get so convicted about this message. But I'm not going to get into all that right now. That's not my main saying. I'm just telling you the first in here. Genesis chapter 14, verse 10. It says, now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled from the five kings, and they fell into them, into those tar pits. <laughs> it had to be a scene. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot. Abraham's nephew and his possessions and departed for he was not living as far as Sodom he was now living in Sodom then a fugitive came and told Abraham his, the Hebrew now he was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite brother of Eschol and brother of Anor and these were allies with Abram. When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, notice what he didn't say. 
He didn't say, I told that boy if he went down there to Sodom that he'd get into trouble. He didn't say that. He didn't say if he hadn't been hanging out there with them sodomites, they, he, he wouldn't be in trouble now, and, 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 and he wouldn't have all of his stuff stolen from him. He didn't say that. Don't, why do we do that when people fall by the wayside? Why do we immediately say, you know, if you had a, a not done, uh, they know that now. It's too late. If you knew they were prone to do that, you should have told them before they did it. Say, look, if you keep continually living like this, can I, can I tell you something? When I was living like that, this is what happened to me. I fell down and I lost all that I had and God had to come into my life and rebuild everything. But now, I'm just telling you what happened to me. It may not happen exactly to you as it happened to me, but I got to tell you something. If you don't change your ways, something's going to happen. Then after they go on their way, they, don't, they say, I'm not doing nothing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Okay. So when they fall, you don't have to say nothing. You know why? Because they already know that the, they got the right advice and they, they just didn't listen. So he led out, so when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So he brings Lot back with his possessions. He's a bad dude, isn't he? Then after his return from the defeat of Shedalamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava. Now, he went out to meet him, and I'm going to show you a contrast in a minute. That is the, king, that is the king's valley. So he goes out to the king's valley, and Melchizedek, Melchizedek, a king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Notice the difference. The other king comes out, doesn't come up with nothing. Melchizedek King of Salem comes, brings out bread and wine. That's associated with communion, which is something that we're going to have today at the end of my message. So I'm going to give you a heads up. Those of you that are watching us online, just go and get yourself a piece of bread somewhere and bring it close to you and keep it there and some juice. Don't matter what kind of juice it is. Okay, I don't care. Don't, and it's not about what it is. Just get some bread and some juice, and we'll, we'll do that together. But now this Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, blessed or blessed, as some say, be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Who delivered his enemies into his hand? The Most High God did. And so Abraham, because of what was just said, gave him a tenth of all that he had. Livestock, gold, silver, whatever it is that he had, whatever he got from fighting in the battle, Abraham gave a tenth of all that to God. Well, to the victor goes the spoil. Right? Right. So Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem and priest of Most High God. Why? Because his presence and power gave him victory 
over the four kings. It wasn't his might or his power. The Bible says it's not by our might, not by our power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Why did Abraham give a tenth? Because of what God did and because of who God was in his life. I mean, it was also because of a vow that I believe Abraham made to God even before he went into battle. He said, well, I didn't see that. It's coming. It was also a way for him to honor Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and uh, the, 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 who, who, gave, who gave him the bread and also the wine. So, Abe's men were fed. Why? Well, I believe that, I mean, if you're just coming out of a battle, it, it was brutal. You're tired, you're weary, you're probably wounded. And so to have bread and wine, bread would nourish you. Maybe a little wine could be pour, poured onto a, a wound of some kind and, and, and drank uh, for, 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 uh, for whatever reason back then. And, and so uh, I believe that he was watching out for their well-being. And so he was trying to take care of them physically because they had come back exhausted and weary. But how can... Melchizedek be both a king and a priest because in the Bible no priest can be king and no king can be priest just like in our Constitution there's a separation of powers between the legislative and the administrative and the judicial branches no president can be a, 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 a Supreme Court justice while being a president. You, 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 can't, you can't do that. And you can't be a senator or a congressman while you are being a Supreme Court justice. You, you, you can't do that. You got to be one or the other. You can't be all of that. So to prove that point, there's a man called King Uzziah. <laughs> he was a wild dude. King Uzziah tried to be both king and priest. And you know what God did? God struck him with leprosy. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was out of his mind. This guy, he's trying to be a priest and a king. You, you can't do that. God doesn't play that. So who was this king and this priest? I'm glad you asked. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. It explains everything. The Old Testament is a shadow. The New Testament is a fulfillment. So if you see something in the Old Testament and you don't understand, it'll probably be explained in the New Testament. In this case, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, who, ate, who, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And then also Salem, which is part of the word Jerusalem, but Salem means peace. So because he was king of Salem, he's also the king of peace without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Christ, doesn't it? But made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now, now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, Abraham the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoil. He was... He was, to me, a picture of pre-incarnate Christ. He was, he just shows up on the scene. Christ did that a lot in the Old Testament. And so he shows up. Many believe that it was a pre-incarnate Christ. All I know is he was like Melchizedek, and, uh, and that's what the, the verse says. Christ was the only king of righteousness, though. And he was, only, he was the only king of peace. 
and he was the only priest of God Most High. So if you want peace, you'll first have to accept the king of righteousness. A lot of folks want peace. You can't get the peace of God until you accept the king of righteousness. Because only the king of righteousness has the authority to give you the peace of God. You can't get the peace of God without the king of righteousness. As they had this saying, uh, no justice, no peace. I would like to say, no Jesus, no peace. No righteousness, no peace. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have peace. You don't have peace of mind. You don't have peace nowhere. But if you have Jesus Christ, then the Bible says, God made him, Christ, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. In whom? In Christ. So if you are now righteous because of Christ, you now have peace with God. Before, you were at odds with God. Before, you, you, you were an enemy of God. But now, you have been adopted by God into his royal family. And now, you are a part of the royal priesthood and a holy nation because now, you are considered righteous. And now, you have peace with God. That's why Jesus said, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest and then take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my burden is, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when you come to Christ, you have peace. You don't worry, don't worry about the burdens. Why? Because I can roll all of my cares over unto Christ. Whenever I'm burdened and I take the world onto my shoulders, which I should not do because I'm a sheep and sheep were never supposed to be burden bearers. And so when I get tired and loaded down with worries, I remember, wait a minute. I'm supposed to rejoice in the Lord. And then I'm supposed to pray, take my petitions to him and thank him. And then I can get all the things that I need if I first seek him and his righteousness. That's when the peace of God comes, when we have the righteousness of Christ. I want to show you the contrasting parallels between the kings of Salem and Sodom. Melchizedek comes to give them bread and wine. But there's a difference with the king of Sodom. He comes to get. Genesis 14, verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give. He can come with nothing. He heard the king, he heard king, uh, the king of righteousness say to Abram, he heard this. He was there. He appeared. He heard him. He heard him say to Abram, I delivered you. He heard him Praise the God most high, but he comes to take. Isn't that just like the devil? When God gives you victory in your life, who's the first one with the handout? The devil. You, how does he come? Oh, he comes in disguises. He said, now that you got that raise, why don't you go out there and blow it on something that you want? Don't worry about tithing. You don't have to worry about that. Don't give nothing to God. He's got nothing. What does he need? He owns the whole world, everything. I mean, and the church don't need nothing. You know, hey, besides, you know, that preacher, you know, don't, don't be paying them nothing either, you know. You know let them let, let go out and find another job on, on the side, you know. You, know. you don't need to be paying him to be your exclusive pastor. I mean, that's how the devil comes. I mean, I remember when I got this first big check, and I, it was more than $100. It was big to me at that time. <laughs> I mean, I, I rejoiced over a little bit, man. I mean, anything, I mean, anything over what I got, I rejoice, you know. And I tell you, I, I, I said, oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. And you know, the first thing the devil said, I want you to go out there and splurge that and have yourself a good old time at the restaurant out there. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to spend about 50 bucks out of this hundred just to eat. And then I got to give a tip. And then I'm going to be hungry tomorrow. 
And then God said, give me a tenth. And anything you want to give me, it doesn't have to be a tenth. You can give me 20%. You give me whatever you want. I just want you to be generous. So I gave God generously. What did I give? That's between me and God. But I was generous. <laughs> you know what happened? I ate for many days after that. I never did go to that restaurant. And God continued to feed me. And I was out of work. Hmm? I'm telling you what God will do if you just trust him. And, and, I, and I, 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 I trust him. So the king of Solomon said to Abram, give the people to me. The word people here in Hebrew is souls. So he's saying, give the souls to me. It sounds like a devil, doesn't it? Because the devil wants the souls of all mankind. And God is saying, I, you know, I, I want your soul. I want you to give your souls to me. So there's a war with the souls of men. The devil wants them and God wants us. And whoever you give, up to, you give yourself out to, that's who you're going to be servant of. He says, give the souls to me and take the riches, the substance, the riches for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high. Now, when did he swear? Well, I went back and looked up the verb tense, and it means that something was sworn to God before the battle. It means that something happened in the past that Abraham did that he promised to do in the future. So now he's in the future and he's saying, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heavens and earth, to what? That I will not take a thread or a shoestring or anything that is yours for fear you would say, I have made Abraham rich. That I, and I, I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. So in other words, he's saying, I'm not going to take nothing, but I'm not going to impose my oath onto my men. I have faith to do that. I'm not going to ask them to do this because I didn't ask them to do this up front. I told God that I was going to do this and that I wasn't going to accept this, but I want my men to make their own decision. You can give them whatever they want. So that, that, that's why, that's why we, we, we don't preach a lot of you got, to do, you got to do this, you must do this, and you must do that kind of stuff here, here at New Covenant. It's all about grace. And see, when we operate in grace and mercy, you give God a whole bunch of stuff. But if we tell you, you got to give a tenth, you know what you'll do? I'll give you this tenth if it kills me. Well, you may not be in a position to give a tenth that month. Okay? Your mama may need something. Or your daddy may need something. Or your child may need something. Well, you mean, you mean, you, you, you mean I, 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 should, I, should, I should help them out? Have you read the New Testament? Jesus told those Pharisees, he said, you withhold tithes when your family needs you trying to show that you're so holy and righteous. Look what God is saying. If you need to help your family, help your family. God understands that. It's not about, I got to do this. I must do this. You do it as unto the Lord with a cheerful heart. If you can't give with a cheerful heart, then keep it. Can you imagine me going up to my wife when I was, you know, proposed to her? And I said, here's that ring you wanted. <laughs> Will you marry me now? Take that ring back. Get your money back. <laughs> Ain't nothing here. No, 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 no. God doesn't want you to come to him like that. No, come to me because you love me. Give to me because you love me. 
And if your family needs something extra and you want to give to me instead of them, then pray to me and ask for me to give you something extra and I'll help you and your family. Come to me. Because I'm the, I'm the possessor of all things. I can make anything happen if you come to me first. And so, I mean, so, so in other words, so here's Abraham telling these young men, and the share of the men who went with me, Aner and, uh, and Eskel and Mamre, let them take their share. I'm not taking nothing from you. I don't want the devil to give me nothing. Because anything he gives me, you know what's going to happen to it? It's going to tear up. It's going to rot. It ain't going to last. But if God gives me something, I know it's going to last. Now, let me go back to this soul business, because in Hebrews chapter 13 and and verse 17, it it talks about yielding the right of way to your leaders. In other words, submit to your leaders. Come under their authority and, 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 and do it in a way that doesn't cause them grief. Because if you cause them grief, (laughs) <laughs> it won't be good for you. And, and, and so, but, but see, it says that we, we the leaders, your pastor and your elders, we watch over your souls because we've got to give an account to God. And so because I've got to give an account to God, I listen very carefully to what he wants to say to me. Last week, for instance, <laughs> one of our members said, Pastor, have I missed communion? And I said, no, ma'am, you haven't missed it. I said, I haven't had it. And uh, I'll explain to you why uh, I hadn't had it in, in a minute. But, but it, it's amazing how God allowed me to go into this new side of most high, most God in this passage of Scripture and just happen to have bread and wine there. So I only move when God tells me to move. And I only do what God tells me to do. A lot of people have communion every, every first Sunday. You can, you can set your watch to it. Huh? Go around any church on the first Sunday in the hood. And I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying I don't have the faith to do it like that. Because the Bible says as often as you do this, let me explain something to you. The verb tense for as often as you do this is subjunctive, which means it's a choice. As often as you choose to do this, do this in remembrance of me. So there are many times that I don't often choose to do that. Why? Because God hasn't told me to do that. I don't follow the crowd. I follow God. I follow the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit wants me to do something, he'll generally send somebody to let me know that he wants it done like he did to the sister last week. And God says, okay, I want you to think about that. I said, okay, God. So when I started studying and I got the bread and wine, I said, oh, that's what you're trying to tell me. See, I want to prepare you so you would do this because there's some people that want you to do this. So I'm going to do it. And we're going to do it after. Uh, Let me get back to my thing here. The king of Sodom acknowledged that Abraham had the right to the riches, the substance. But he wanted the people, the souls. Now, the king had rights to both the people and the riches. He king. Abraham's not a king. This is is the king of, of Sodom. So he had the right to it. But he refused to accept, Abraham refused to accept anything for himself because he had sworn an oath by lifting up his hands to God, saying, God, give us victory in this battle. And when I come out of this battle, I'll give you tenth of the spoils of everything that I have. He had compassion for the fallen, his nephew Lot. Lot, his nephew, who'd fallen into sin, Abraham didn't chastise him. He didn't rebuke him. He went and saved that boy. He had courage to fight, and he also had a conviction of faith in God. This is who Abraham was. 
Do we have compassion for the fallen? Do we have compassion for people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ? Can we in some way have compassion for them because God has compassion for us? And, and he came to save us because of his compassion and because of his mercy with which he loved us, even when we was, even when we're dead in our sins and trespasses. He, Abraham, confessed his commitment to God because of what God did and who God was in his life. He, God was, his king, his king of righteousness and his king of peace and the priest of God most high. As a priest, God pitied Abraham and his men and he fed them bread and wine. But as king, the king of kings defeated all those other kings that came up against his servant. Why? Because he is king over all kings and he's Lord of hosts over all the humankind and mankind on the earth. As priest, he has prayed for you and me. Each day he prays for us. He prays and intercedes for us. Romans 8 says that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us all the time. It's consistently He's interceding on our behalf. Even when the Holy Spirit isn't praying for us, when we don't know how to pray, we can always count on Jesus who's always interceding on our behalf every day, constantly. That's the verb tense. He never stops praying for us. As king, he died with a crown of thorns pressed down on his head. As priest, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As king, there was an inscription written on a little plaque that was over the cross over his head. It said, Jesus, the king of the Jews, who is he in your life? Is he your king? If he's your king, he's also your priest. If he's not your king, he's not your high priest. The high priest is only for his people. And Jesus is a high priest over the people of God, over those he has chosen to be a part of the royal priesthood and the family of God. If he is your righteousness, he is also your priest and your peace. Let me give you this final thing here. Next sticky note. Well, let's, let me give you some for instance. When God gives you the victory, don't forget to give the spoils to the victor. Who's the victor? God. Don't forget to give God the glory. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar went out and said, Oh, look at my kingdom. Look at my palace. That boy, before he died, he was going to EA. You know what EA is? Ego Anonymous. <laughs> if they had Ego Anonymous, nobody would go. Because everybody think that they're too high and mighty. So be going in, I ain't got no ego. Yeah, you do. Don't give what belongs to God to the devil. Okay? Don't do that. I mean, everybody that has their hand out, pray about it. Because, you know, you are just a funnel. God gives you whatever it is that you have, but you don't have authority over what you do with it. God determines what you do with his spoils. I mean, it belongs to him. So, God, what do you want to do with it? There's a song that says, victory is mine. Victory today is mine. And then the other lyric is, I told Satan, get thee behind me. Victory today is mine. Well, first of all, part of that's wrong. Okay? Because the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. And who is my faith in? Christ, God Almighty. And who has given victory to me over sin? Christ. So the victory is really Christ. Victory, we ought to change it to victory is Jesus. <laughs> and you know, the last time a person talked to the devil except God, they got in trouble. 
Eve started conversing, or as they say in the hood, conversating uh, with the de- with the de- with the devil. Okay, he said, "Wait, ain't compensating the, the right way? No, it's conversing." But anyway, you always just keep doing it, whatever you're going to do. Point I'm making is, don't talk to the devil. Okay? Because anytime you talk to the devil, you ain't, you wasting your breath. Because the enemy is under his feet. Remember what he said in, 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 in Genesis? He said, the enemy is going to bruise your heel. Well, how can, he, how can he bruise his heel unless it's under his feet? Amen? So don't, the only thing, look, let me remember in Jude, it said that, um, uh, that, 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 that the angel had all authority, but they didn't, they didn't say anything to the devil. They didn't, they didn't rail at the devil. They didn't rebuke the devil. They said, you know what he said? The Lord rebukes you. Okay, so this is, and, but the Bible says, resist the devil and he will what? Flee. So when he starts talking to you, just go, I don't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so our victory belongs to Jesus, not us. He's both our victor and victory. Abe had compassion for the fallen. He had enough courage to fight. We need to fight a good fight of faith every day. He also had conviction of faith. Do you have a conviction of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? He also confessed his commitment to God. Have you ever confessed a commitment to Almighty God? Are you willing to confess him as Lord? The Bible says, as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you shall be saved. If you're willing to do that, then do that. Now I want you to do me a favor, those of you who have this little container, if you would just peel back the top part of it uh, and you'll see the, the little wafer in there, uh, the first clear part. My nails are a little, uh, I, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done what I did to my nails. I cut them, and I can't even get, y'all do it. Take out the bread. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, in the night that Jesus appeared to, uh, to Paul, he spoke to him, and he told him how to have communion. And so in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and he said, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. If you would, take that wafer and just break it in half and then eat it. If you would, I'd appreciate you. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you drink it? Father, I thank you so much for your word today. I thank you that we're able to have communion. Thank you for those online that are doing it with us. Thank you for the sister who set me up for you. <laughs> Lord, I thank you that you, you send people to, to, to prepare me for things that you want me to do, and I thank you for that. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And if your heart loves the Lord Jesus Christ, say amen. 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 God- wow. Thanks again for joining us. If you want to respond to what you've heard, hit the connect link above. Don't worry. We're not going to blow up your phone or spam your inbox, but we will help you with what's next. Till next week, God bless. <laughs>